All right, all right. Shalom, shalom, shalom. We are live in the building with uh, Brother Mike Holloway, Elder Mike Holloway, and uh, Brother Jephtha Norgacy, who's going to be the moderator for this evening. Um, we will be discussing the topic of does mainstream Christianity teach iniquity? Once again, that topic is does mainstream Christianity teach iniquity? And we want to have a brotherly debate here, uh, debate the issues with any kind of animosity or what have you and confusion. We are going to attempt to get down to the issues. Now, I, I had was planning to do a, um, what do you call it, PowerPoint. Uh, but unfortunately, I did not get to actually do the PowerPoint. Well, finish it because we had our schedules uh, mixed up there. We originally oh. scheduled for Thursday and I was under the impression that I had enough time until Sunday. And so uh, I, I don't have a full PowerPoint for you guys on this evening, but we will uh, improvise and adapt and overcome the most high willing. So. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself, uh, uh, Elder Mike? All right, sure. I will introduce myself. This My name is Elder Mike Holloway. I am from Detroit, Michigan. I am an elder of Power, Hope, and Grace uh, Bible Church. I've been a member there for the past close to 30 years. Uh, lover of the word of God, uh, lover of the Christian faith and believer in the truth. I'm just here to represent the true Christian faith, hopefully to inform people in ways perhaps they were not made aware initially. So I appreciate the invite and uh, we're looking to glorify God tonight. So God bless you. Okay, I appreciate that, Elder Mike. Uh, Brother Jaffet, the moderator, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. This will be a moderated debate. And uh, uh, we're going to go ahead and introduce the moderator here on this evening. Oh, I wasn't expecting to introduce myself, but uh, my name is Jeff De Norgas. Um, I will be moderating this debate. I will be unbiased. And I will be holding everybody accountable to their time and uh, at hand. Um, hopefully everybody learns and they can take from whatever is said and hopefully the truth will set you free all right all right and once again i am uh the host the defender of the way and i will be arguing on the side of christianity uh in the affirmative that in fact christianity does uh teach iniquity and uh, Elder Mike, uh, my brother and uh, fellow debater there, will be arguing the negative position that Christianity does not, in fact, teach iniquity. And so uh, you want to go ahead and start and give the rounds and all of that, uh, Brother Jeff, and the time limits. All right. So we're going to be starting up with the opening. Um, each of you will have... 10 minutes for an open if you choose to um, basically end your time before the 10 minutes just let me know um, after that we have a 10 minute premise for the both of you afterwards we will have 10 minute rebuttal then a 10 minute interrogation and you each will have 5 minutes to close alright 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 uh, uh who's gonna be starting between you two um uh, you guys want to flip the coin or uh brother mike um he's uh the visiting elder so he can decide whether he wants to go or he wants me to go first it doesn't matter on my end well um i think if you don't mind going first that would be good in that you are the one who uh, is stating that Christianity promotes iniquity, and then I'll know how to respond to your premise. 
Okay, actually, I didn't uh, do my premise here, so I'm going to have to go ad hoc. Here. You want me to go first? I can go first. Ain't no problem. I only, no, nah, that's, I mean, I have an opening um, prepared if you wanted to, you know, have me do the opening and then uh, you do your opening and we do the premise from there. It's up to you, bro. Either way, either way. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Brother Jaff, if you want to go ahead and uh, get set up for the, um, the time limit there for the opening. All right. Let me know when you're ready. I'll start the time. Okay. Give All right. Me again. One second. Never mind. Okay. So uh, the topic here is Does mainstream Christianity teach iniquity? Uh, Nazarene Hebrew, Brother Sam Addison versus uh, Pauline Christian apologist, uh, Elder Mike uh, Holloway debate. Um, Matthew, uh, the seventh chapter, gives us a preview of the future of those who practice Christianity. Here's what Hamashiach, whom the world calls the Christ, says. Matthew chapter number seven, verse number 15 in the King James Version. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Uh, Matthew chapter number seven, verse number 15 says, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Adonai, Adonai, shall enter into the kingdom of Shemaim. But he that doeth the will of my father, which is in Shemaim. Many will say to me in that day, Adonai, Adonai, have we not prophesied, which means to preach in thy name. And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works verse 23 key verse and then will i profess unto them i never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity when we take a look at and compare the various english translations of the greek text we find that there is a consensus among scholars who translated the text into english the ergozame anomia which means to work iniquity is a reference to what we would call lawbreakers matthew chapter number seven verse number 23 and then in the new king james version and then i will declare to them i never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness matthew chapter number seven verse number 23 in a new living translation but i will reply i never knew you get away from me you who break allah laws Matthew chapter number seven, uh, verse number 23. And I think it's the complete standard Bible. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you depart from me, you lawbreakers. Matthew chapter number seven in the ESV. And then I will declare unto them, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Erga, uh, the word definition for uh, ergono, er, ergozame, anomia, which means to work iniquity, ergonomia being, uh, meaning to work and uh, anomia meaning iniquity, which is often translated as lawlessness. When we take a look at the definition from the Strong's concordance, it comes from the, uh, Strong's Greek concordance for, uh, number 459. And it means illegality. In other words, violation of the law, is often tra times translated as wickedness, iniquity, uh, uh, transgression of the law or unrighteousness. When we take a look at the outline of biblical usage, uh, it'll bring up the various and my screen is went blank here on me. Uh, the condition of without law, uh, because ignorant of it, because of violating it contempt and violation of the law, iniquity and wickedness. When we talk about the outline of biblical usage, we're talking about how the Bible actually uses the term. Now, you'll notice that in the previous definition, it tells us that that word anomos comes from the root word, uh, uh, anomia comes from the root word anomos. That root word means lawlessness, according to the Strong's Concordance, not subject to the Jewish, I don't like that term, the mosaic 
law by implication a gentile so this term is oftentimes used uh to reference gentiles and it means without law lawless transgressor unlawful or wicked the outline of biblical usage uh means that one that is destitute of mo of the mosaic law it is often used once again uh to reference the gentile and it and it means departing from the law a violator of the law a lawless one or wicked the translation comparison the strong's definition in the outline of biblical usage is clear that the word anomia is a reference to someone who breaks the law as a matter of custom or practice and is therefore considered lawless but how can we be certain as to exactly what law is being talked about for this we have to rely upon the immediate context of the passage and the biblical usage of the word anomia when we go just a few verses up in the same text we are referencing we find this verse which makes it clear that the law that is being referenced is that which was taught by the uh taught in the tanakh by the prophets um in other words the law given to moshe and confirmed by the prophets matthew chapter number seven same chapter verse number 12 therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do ye even so to them why for this is the law and the prophets matthew chapter number seven verse number 12 in the new living translation i like the way they put it do to others whatsoever whatever you would like them to do to you why because this is the essence of all that is taught in the law and in the prophets the teaching of the prophets which yeshua hamashiach whom the world calls Jesus Christ was uh, was uh, teaching that is found in the Tanakh in, in the Torah, uh, which is also known as the law. We know that because it comes from the uh, uh, Leviticus, which says thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. So this is the principle. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, for I am Yahuwah. And so this is the teaching that we find uh, Hamashiach teaching uh, just before he gets into uh, how to determine who's a false prophet uh, and knowing them by their fruit. When we get into the broader context, it, uh, the broader context is found in looking at how the word anomia is used elsewhere in the Bible to see if we can make a connection, to see if I've committed in what's called a root word fallacy here. And so we have uh, Hebrews chapter number one, verse number nine in the King James Version say thou has loved righteousness and hated iniquity, which is the uh, Greek word anomia. Therefore, Allah Hayyim, even thou Allah Hayyim, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The author of Hebrews in this text used anomia to refer to the wickedness mentioned in Psalms. He's quoting, uh, paraphrasing Psalms chapter number 45, verse number seven. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Uh, the, the, the Hebrew word there is the Hebrew word rasha. Therefore, Allahayim, thy Allahayim have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. The reason why I connected this is to show you guys that the New Testament authors are, are using that same word, anomia, to reference the, the, the Rasha and the uh, uh, Avon of the Old Testament. Rasha meaning the Hebrew word Rasha is concretely meaning to depart from the way. Uh, the concrete meaning of the word iniquity, which is translated, uh, the word avon, which is translated in the Old Testament as iniquity, means to twist. And so we have an individual that twists, departs from the way, or twists the way, causing them to break the commandments. And so um, I'm trying to click my screen here. It's not going. The author of Hebrews also uses anomia to describe the iniquity or avon that the Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah and Micah also talked about. 
for I, uh, Hebrews 8 and 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquity will I remember no more. Hebrews 10 and 17, and their sin and iniquity will I remember no more. Uh, the author in Hebrews is getting this from Jeremiah chapter number 50, verse number 20. In those days and in that time, saith Yahuwah, the iniquity of Yasharal shall be sought for and there shall be none and the sins of Yahuda, and they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I reserve. Micah 7 and 19, he will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. So we see the author of Hebrews is using the same word, anamia, to reference the wickedness, the rasha and the avon in the Old Testament. So we know we have a connection here between that word anomia and the iniquity and the wickedness that's mentioned in the old testament by now it should be very clear that the christ and his apostles who wrote the new testament used the word say again that's time this is up. okay all right um mike let me know when you're ready okay okay can you hear me Yes, we um, can hear you, bro. Okay, and that was your intro. Yeah, that's, that's my, the opening. my opening. Your, that was the opening. All right, all right. Let me, you know, mine won't won't be long. Basically, I open by saying right off the top that the accusation that Christianity teaches iniquity is absolutely false. The claim itself lacks evidence, truth, substance, scripture support. And bottom line, it lacks common sense. It amounts to fiction made up in the minds of men who choose to condemn that they haven't studied. Why would one make this claim? Who in their right minds would accuse Christians who serve the Christ of the Holy Scripture, who did not sin, nor was there guile found in his mouth? What would possess people to make such a claim that the Christians who are followers of Christ would live in sin? I can sum it up with just one word. It's the word ignorance. Now that's not an insult and I'm not insulting my brother Sam nor anybody who holds that personal belief. I'm sure they're all wonderful people, but wonderful people can be wondrously wrong. They've been misadvised, ill-informed and lied to. And the only reason I accepted this debate was out of a sincere desire to educate men who perhaps have never truly heard the undeniable, irrefutable, and undefeatable case for Christianity. I will prove tonight that Christianity fully represents the historic faith of the scriptures. Christianity is the faith of Simon, who was called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Matthias, who was elected to replace Judas after he lost his delegation. Historically, even, we have validation for the historic Christian faith. For we have church fathers such as Polycarp, who declared in his writings on the way to his martyrdom, he said, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian. We have Barnabas, who said, without grace, there is no hope, but with it, there is no shortage. We have Arrhenius of Lyons who said, the business of the Christian is nothing else but to be ever preparing for death. We have Justin Martyr who said, let it be understood that those who are not found living as he ought are not Christian, even though they profess with the lips the teaching of Christ. Listen, both biblically and historically, a true Christian is one who is not only a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. As stated, anyone who makes the fallacious claim that Christianity promotes iniquity, I don't hold it against them. They simply don't understand Christianity. 
Christianity is the historic Christian faith. It's the historic faith of the scripture. It is the faith preached by all of the apostles, including the apostle Paul. It is the faith that I stand on tonight. It is the faith that have saved me, even as a Christian who does not promote nor practice iniquity. Christianity is the historic Christian faith, and I yield. You have six minutes and 37 seconds left. All right, we're going to move on to the 10-minute premise. Um, do you want to switch it up, um, Sam, or do you want to go first again? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll just keep it in flow like we're doing now. Um, and I'll go ahead and start my premise. I'll start, the, I'll start the time whenever you go ahead. Ready when you're ready, bro, because I don't have a PowerPoint for this part. I didn't get to do that. All right, go ahead and commence. Okay, now I want you guys to notice how bro did not even deal with any of the text that I brought out. He didn't deal with the uh, etymology of the word iniquity there. Iniquity in the text there, anomia, means to be outside of the Mosaic law in that context. When we take it into, that's the Greek abstract. When you look at the Hebrew word for iniquity, which is avon, it means to twist. Concretely, it means to twist. Uh, so something that is twisted uh, is what the Hebrews understood to be iniquity. So when the term was used in the context of the law, they understood it as someone that was twisting the law and so or a corruption of the law or a perversion of the law. Christianity, actually, um, as you guys that are listening are well aware of, uh, the majority in the mainstream tells you that the law is done and over with that. So that in itself places them outside of the law. If you guys remember and you look up that word in your uh, strong concordance and look at the outline of biblical usage, as I showed, it says one that is outside of the Mosaic law. And we know that Christianity teaches salvation and justification outside and apart from the Mosaic law. And so it is also uh, those that uh, uh, are apologists, they will tell you, uh, oh, well, you know, we don't really, uh, you know, go against the law. The law is not done away with. However, we keep the law spiritually or we keep the law through love. So what that is called is a twisting of on the Hebrew word concretely of on. It is a twisting of the actual law. It is a twisting to the point where they become lawbreakers. I'll give you an example. I just gave you one. Christianity teaches that uh, salvation comes apart or justification comes apart from the law. And I'm sure uh, my brother over there is looking up a uh, text from Paul, Paul uh, that's going to say, and this is why we call them Pauline Christians, because they're going to run to uh, Paul and attempt to eisegetically misinterpret the text. Uh, where Paul says, now we know that justification is coming outside or apart from the law. And when he does that, I will go ahead and, uh, you know, give a proper exegesis of those passages. But I want you guys to take note of that, uh, that Christians actually with the, the, the definition of iniquity is one who twists or corrupts or perverts the law to the point where they are outside of the commandments where they do not the commandments are not required as a part of justification and we know this for a fact anyone that's been around christianity for any uh period of time i have 30 years of experience as a christian uh i've been to bible college and learned all of the uh uh theology and i know for a fact 
that uh, their doctrine of justification, their soteriology is actually teaching iniquity. In other words, it teaches either a corrupted or twisted form of the law. Well, we could keep it through love or they tell you flat out that the law is done away with. We obtain justification and salvation outside of the law. That fits the classic definition of iniquity. When we look at the text in Matthew chapter number seven, verse uh, 20, I think it is through 23. He says, now everyone that saith unto me, Adonai, Adonai, or Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of Shemaim. But those that do the will, which is the law of my father, he said, many shall say unto me in that day. These are not my words. These are the words of a Mashiach talking about those that do not keep the law. He said, many shall come to me in that day and say, uh, Adonai, Adonai, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Prophesy means to preach. What group of people preaches in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, who they call Jesus the Christ? What folk are, is it the Muslims? Is it, is it atheists? Is it, is it, is it Hindus? No, it's Christians who practice Christianity. They preach in the name of Jesus. What folk uh, uh, cast out demons uh, in the name or say they're casting out demons in the name of Jesus? That would be Christians who practice Christianity. What group of folks say we do a lot of philanthropic work? We feed the homeless. We, When, when there was an earthquake, we gave money here. Uh, we feed the poor. We got prison ministries. What group of people does these things? The only group of people that I know that do these things that are highly publicized are Christians who practice Christianity. But what did Hamashiach say about these people? He said that although they preach, although they cast out demons, although they do great works in my name, when it comes time to be in judge, I will tell them, depart from me, ye transgressors of Torah. You folk who try to obtain justification outside of and apart from the law of Moses. You folk who attempt to twist the law of Moses and say, well, you know, it's not really done away with, but we keep it through love. Totally ignoring what John said, that the love of the Alahayim and the love of the brother is keeping the commandments of the Alahayim, whom the world calls God. And so they totally uh, throw away these texts and disregard these texts and depend on eisegetical misinterpretations of Paul. Now, I've already proven here by definition that uh, iniquity means to be outside of because you have either twisted or corrupted the text or and, and wickedness, which we see the author of Hebrews using the same word anomia to refer to that same iniquity of on twisting up of the law and that same wickedness being outside of the law and apart from the law and trying to be justified uh, outside of, of keeping the uh, righteousness which is contained in the law. We've already seen that as a definition and we already know that Christians in fact does teach this. So it's not based on ignorance on my part, it's based on taking the text that Hamashiach said himself, looking at the etymologies of the word, going into doing your word study and uh, comparing the doctrines of Christianity like justification, solo fide, we are saved just by a carnal ascension of uh, a, a carnal uh, belief or a, a, a simple believing in the in Hamashiach. And that's not what Paul was teaching. It comes from an ignorance of knowing the Greek word pistis uh, does not mean just uh, a belief when you understand what Paul was actually saying. And so they twist Paul's writings. Uh, Peter told us that. He says that uh, they, they're going to twist Paul's writings, the scripture contained in Paul's writings, 2 Peter chapter number three, just like they do the other scripture. And he called it the way of the wicked. And so we know or the way of the transgressors or the way of those who practice iniquity. And so if iniquity means outside of the law or to twist the law, it, 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 then Christianity and Christianity actually teaches that salvation is obtained apart from the law. And they twist Paul's writings to actually uh, try to support uh, uh, their doctrine 
of justification solo fighting. We're not justified by the law. Uh, we're justified by faith and believing and love and all of these things to the point where they say you do not have to actually do and keep the, the, the righteousness contained in the law of Moses. So by definition, and I'm closing, by definition in itself, by definition of the term iniquity, which means to twist concretely in the Hebrew or to be uh, abstractly outside of the law in the Greek abstract, we know that Christianity fits both of these. And the doctrines of Christianity, like justification, uh, solo, solo fide, and, 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 and others, the soteriology, which is the uh, study of salvation and the, the, the doctrines that deal with salvation, they teach outside of the law. And we're going to get into that more so when we get into the interrogation and you're going to see how this actually breaks down. It's not an ignorance on my part. It's actually an ignorance on the part of Christianity. And it's also a twisting of the text, which we're going to witness here uh pretty shortly um by my predictions i'm done oh no nah, i'm good bro um so can you guys hear me Hello? yeah all right um quick question um yes i'm here i'm here it's really a statement uh, essentially, the premise and the opening are pretty much the same thing. So, do you want to go straight into the rebuttals, Mike, or do you want to give a ten minute pre um, premise? If well, um, yeah, give me a minute because he went, and then we'll go. We'll just keep it flowing. So, I guess we can do basically two versions of rebuttals. I guess I won't be ten minutes though. So. Okay. So yeah. we're gonna go into the last ten minute of the premise. Um, ready when you are. Okay, okay. Uh, it's a lot of in interesting information shared. Uh, Sam says I didn't respond to any of the things that he said. Well, well that's because we're not in the rebuttals, <laughs> right? That we're stating my premise and and building uh, my case. Uh, so during the rebuttals, uh, I certainly uh, don't, as, as well as in the interrogation rounds, I definitely will respond to any of the accusations that were made. But let me just point, I'm building the case that Christianity does not promote iniquity. Here's what Christians believe, that by grace we have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Watch this. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That verse is foundational and very significant in the Christian faith. First and foremost, our salvation rests in grace through faith in Christ and Christ alone, right? And that's sola fide. <laughs> uh, I don't really use the term, but I just want to help you understand what term is sola fide. It is not of ourselves. We could not earn salvation. We could not merit salvation and neither of us have ever deserved salvation. But as Paul eloquently said in Ephesians 2 verse 4, he said, but God, Right. We were dead. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Christians understand that we are not work less in salvation. We just don't work for our salvation. We believe God. God counts our faith as righteousness and our good works follow. For James declared that faith without works is dead. Let me define a Christian for you, Brother Sam. The etymology of the word Christian goes back to Acts chapter number 11. As Luke records that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. But why were they called Christians? 
What were the significant characteristics that classified them as Christians? Well, Acts chapter 11, verse 20 tells us it was because they preached Christ, a Christian. It is the Christians, uh, Christos. It is one who is identified as a believer and follower of Christ. He is one who carries the testimony of Jesus Christ, Yeshua from the Old Testament Hebrew. We preach Christ in him crucified. Not only that, but on the third day, he was raised from the dead with all power. So a Christian carries the testimony of Christ. The fulfillment of all the law and the prophets has come and is in the savior of the world. He uh, is the savior effectually for those who believe and trust in him. Watch this. A Christian is one who obeys no, you don't believe this, but it's true, my friend. A Christian is one who obeys the commands, watch this, of Christ. We're Christians, not Mosaicians. We're Christians. We obey the commands of Christ. St. John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my, not Moses's, but my commandments. The same Christian faith Paul declared to King Agrippa in Acts chapter number 28. As the king declared to Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a what? A Christian. This Idumenian Edomite king was almost persuaded to become a Christian, right? Paul declared back to the Christian. He said, I would to God that you were not only almost, but altogether such as I am. What was Paul doing? He was declaring his Christian faith, save these bonds. This is the faith we live and declare concerning the life, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not a faith that promotes uh, iniquity. That, that's just ludicrous, but rather holiness. For the scripture says in Galatians chapter number five, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control, faith, Notice he goes on to say, against such, there is no law. I know those, those verses kind of, you know, some people don't like those verses, but they're in there. And those who are Christ, watch this, have crucified the flesh. See, that's not a person who practices iniquity. That's a person who's living for God. He has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. A Christian is not one who displays any of those sinful things. Watch what Paul says in Ephesians chapter number five. Do not be drunk with wine. Huh, that sounds like iniquity. Christians don't do that. We are not drunk with, we shouldn't be drunk with wine, right? In which is dissipation. But we are what? Filled with the spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, make, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. Watch what Paul says in Galatians chapter number five. I mean, I'm just going to give you the word of God because this is what a, a Christian is. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, uh, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of the which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past. Watch this. This is what Christians preach, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, we're not those that push or promote iniquity. That's just ludicrous. A Christian does not promote the wickedness of the works of the flesh, nor does a Christian practice those things. Notice what John said in his first letter, in chapter number three. He says, whoever is born of God, watch this. This is what Christians preach, does not practice sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot see it because he is born of God. This is the Christian faith. It's built on the empty tomb, my friend, the resurrected savior. Paul says in Romans chapter number six, what shall we say to him? Shall we continue in what? Sin, that grace may abound. Guess what Paul said? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him 
through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, watch this, Christians, we also should walk in newness of life. Again, a Christian is one who practices righteousness. He denies himself. He kills off the works of the flesh. I will prove as we get into this that it is actually the opposing view who promotes iniquity by laying upon people laws that no Israelite has ever been able to keep and they still don't keep today. There's not one of them keeping the laws perfectly and they will Will not and cannot, which is why we trust in the living Savior for our salvation. I yield. All right, we had roughly two minutes left. Now we're gonna go. To, um, each have ten minutes. Now, for these rebuttals, do you guys want to go back and forth for ten minutes, or do you want to give a? Um, you just want to. Just have a, your own little monologue for a 10 minute straight. How do you guys want to do this? Or is that, um, you guys want to reserve that for the interrogation? I'm good either way. Well, actually, the actually the rebuttal is uh, my turn to rebut what he just said. Sure. And then, then the interrogations okay. is asking questions back and forth. Yeah. Then okay. No problem. So for the interrogation, it will be 10 minutes straight. So we'll be taking turns between both of you. And ready when you are, Sam. I'm ready. Okay. Now, right, I want you guys to take note how he just did exactly what I said that he was going to do. Now, he went to Paul to tell us how he does not have to keep the Mosaic law because he's not a Mosaic, right? Now, I showed you guys in Matthew chapter number seven that the context was the Mosaic law. Hamashiach, whom you guys called the Christ, was actually teaching the Mosaic law. That when he said that uh, practicing iniquity uh, means outside being outside of the law or twisting the law, uh, he just actually confirmed that, that Christians don't, they're not justified by keeping the law they're not justified by any works they are justified by faith solo fide as he said right okay let me go ahead and share my screen here and let's get the words of hamashiach himself let's see what jesus actually said right let's see if he agrees with brother mike or he agrees that uh when he returns he's going to judge folks by their works right Let's see if he said that, or let's see if Sam is so ignorant as uh, my brother is, is, is trying to make me out to be that I just made these things up, right? Let's see what this says, right? Um, Matthew chapter number 16, verse um, number 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his faith. Uh-oh, man, I, I made a mistake. No, nah, that doesn't say faith. That says actually works, right? When the Hamash, this is justification, right? This is dealing with justification and salvation, right? When Hamashiach returns, when he comes back to bring judgment upon folk, how is he going to judge them according to their belief and believing in him? Uh-uh. And this is the words in red. These are the words of the Christ himself. He says that he's coming to judge folks according to their works. So now you see how Paul's writings are twisted to go directly against what the Christ himself says. Now, my brother says we're not going to be judged according to their works. We don't follow the law of Moses because we follow the law of of Christ. Now, when we get into the uh, interrogation round, I'm going to be asking him to show us laws of Christ that so he can go ahead and prepare for that. Uh, that was not in Torah. Right. So now uh, if we go to the book of Revelations as well, I don't have it up on my screen. Uh, it'll tell you also as well. I think it's around the 20 something chapter, uh, 21st chapter, the 22nd chapter. It tells you that every man living and dead were judged according 
to their works, right? So now if we got out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So now we got Hamashiach himself before he died, was buried and resurrected, said, when I come back, I'm going to judge. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can go ahead uh, and pull this up for you guys so you guys can see it. Uh, for yourself. I know I'm kind of wasting my time here because most of you guys probably know this. Some of you guys uh, don't. Most of the Christians don't know this, uh, you know, because they're so hung up on justification, solo fide, according to their works. And hopefully you guys can see how simple this is. It's not, you don't need a theological degree or none of this to actually do this and actually see what the Bible says about works out of the mouth of the Christ himself. And this is one reason why I call these guys Paulinians. Well, I didn't make up the term. It's actually a term that was made up by 20th century, century scholars because they noted a difference between Pauline Christianity and what the Bible actually teaches. So, which they call early Christianity. I disagree with Christianity being used at all. And if we get into that, I'll show you why. The reason why is because the Nazarene descendants of the first century church actually rejected Christianity and the term Christian. He went to Acts uh, chapter number 11 talking about Christians, but actually when you go into the oldest and best manuscripts, like the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, it says Christian. C-H-R-E-S-T-I-A-N, which actually just means goody goody. Uh, Christian was added later. And if we get into that, I have the documented the resources for that. And we can go into the uh the primary sources, which would be the uh the the the, the historians and scholar like Pliny and all of those folks who use the word Christian to refer to. Uh, the, the followers of Hamashiach. Now, Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 12. And I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before the Alahayim, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged, right? Judged. When you get judged, you either be condemned or you are justified, right? So we're still talking about justification out of the things which were written in those books according to their faith, right? According to Sola Fide, right? And wrong. So this is my second witness, according to their works. V Revelations 20 and 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell uh, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So now my brother just twisted Paul's writings to make him lawless and, 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 and a promulgator of iniquity, which means to be outside of the law, uh, because of transgression of the law or because you break uh, 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 break the law. You're outside of the law because of ignorance or because of transgression. Right. So now uh, the text says uh, we just I just gave you. Is that my time? I just gave you and Matthew tells you right out of the mouth. Of the, go ahead. Is that my time? No, out of the mouth. OK, out of the mouth of the Hamashiach himself. This is why I say these guys placed their twisted versions of what Paul said above the Christ himself. We're not gonna be judged by our works. You heard it out of the brother's mouth yourself. We're not gonna be judged by our works. We're gonna be judged and justified and saved by faith. Not understanding that the Greek word peace is there in which I get, if I get the opportunity there, it doesn't just mean uh, 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 a, a carnal ascension, a mental ascension or belief, it actually means to be consistent, to be consistent in the way. This is what Paul was talking about when he says justified by faith. In other words, you're going to be justified by how you consistently keep Torah. And I can prove that. And I hope he challenges me on it and make me prove it. So Revelations chapter number 20, verse 13, uh, Matthew chapter number 16. These are the words of Hamashiach from beginning uh, to the end, because this is the revelation that Jesus Christ, who we call Yeshua HaMashiach, gave to John, right? And the revelation that he gave was every man is going to be a judge according to their works. Judge, when, when someone is judged, they're either condemned or they're justified, right? And so these folks that were judged were either condemned or justified by their works, not by what they believed in. The devils, the, the, the Bible tells us that the, the devils believe 
and, uh, and fear. So they believe, are they going to be saved and justified and all of that kind of stuff? No, every man is going to be justified according to their works. Now, my brother's going to tell you that these are just good works. Um, we have some other Christian apologists tell you they're just general good works. And so once again, they are putting aside the works that the most high laid out in his Torah, the righteousness contained in the law given to Moshe for their own works. So they're going about to do the establish their own works of righteousness. So once again, I have proven that these folks are outside of Torah. These folks are outside of the law. You heard the brother say, we don't follow Moses. We don't follow the, the commandments of Moshe. We practice solo fide, which is a Greek term which twisted what faith actually is to tell you that you're going to be judged by your faith. And that's just false according to the words of a Mashiach himself, whom you guys call the Christ, uh, according to what he said when he was on earth and in his resurrected body, in his glorified state, it still didn't change in Revelations chapter number 20 and 13. Sin, sin, according to 1 John 3 and 4, is the same word, anomia here, whosoever committed sin, transgressive also the law, the law of Moses, not the law of, 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 of Christ, which is the same law of Moses, which is the same, and I'll prove that, for sin is transgression of the law. So now we've changed the definition of sin, right? That word sin here is, is the same word anomia that was used in Matthew chapter number seven and 23. It's just being translated now as sin as opposed to iniquity. So iniquity is transgression of the law, right? Whosoever committed uh, iniquity, which is being outside of the law, is transgression of the law. And the New Testament version of sin and iniquity does not change from the Old Testament, right? That's what John says. It's not... That's time. That's my time. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, Mike. You got ten minutes for your rebuttal. After that, we're gonna go into the interrogations. All right. All right. All right. So Sam said a whole lot of I can prove that, and I can prove that, and I can prove that, but he hadn't proved any of them yet. Um. So th there seems to be an issue here with uh, r r you know, reading the text. <laughs> so so let me just read the text romans chapter 5 verse number one says therefore having been justified by faith as sam would say so to fight a <laughs> we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ therefore having been justified by faith so this is what sam has done this whole time he goes to judgment passages and say, see, he said we're not going to be judged according to our works. Wait a minute, Sam. And I'm taking my time for a reason because I want not only you, but those that listen to comprehend. Justify and judgment are two different things. <laughs> Absolutely that we were going to be judged by the things we do. All right. But we are justified by faith. They're two different words. Dikaio, dikaio rather, in Greek, the, the word for justify. That is not the word for judged. I didn't say this. The scripture says, therefore, having been justified by faith. Did not tell Sam that we don't keep laws. I, he said I did. I, I challenged him to find it on the tape. As a matter of fact, I proved that Christians were uh, abiders of those that don't sin. And I listed out the 17 works of the flesh in Galatians chapter number five. Sam's on something different, right? And every time Sam sees the word command, he thinks Moses. That's not what Jesus said, though. <laughs> That's not what Jesus said at all. As a matter of fact, the Apostle John said that the law was given by Moses, but contrary to right, grace and peace comes by Jesus Christ. Sam went to Matthew chapter number seven. And in Matthew chapter number seven, he tried to make an argument <laughs> based on what Christians say. He says, who preaches in the name of Jesus? It's those Christians. Well, thank God. Because the scripture tells us that when we go preach in his name, he said, so he thinks that Matthew chapter seven, 
and this is mind boggling to me. He believes that Matthew chapter number seven applies to Christians because Christians preach in his name. <laughs> I, I mean, who doesn't preach? If Listen, if you're not preaching in the name of Christ, you are a cursed. You are a preaching a different gospel. Absolutely Christians preaching in the name of Christ. Then Sam misquoted the text again. He started talking about the feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. That's not what Matthew chapter seven said at all. Matthew chapter seven was about outward spiritual works, right? Not inward acts of charity. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter number 25, when Jesus told the sheep that are on his right hand, he says, because you clothed me, because you fed me, because you visited me, that's not what Matthew chapter number seven again. Again, Sam has a problem with uh, a word that, and again, I'm not insulting Sam. I have no problem with, with with the brother at all. But I'm just correcting his theology. He has a he has a problem with what we call context, right? Judgment, justification, two different things. Christians are justified by faith. Sam, you cannot, and, and we'll hopefully we get into this in the interrogation round, you can't point out a sin <laughs> that you think that we Christians are, aren't doing, that I can't prove you wrong. Absolutely. You have not levied one sin. He says this debate is supposed to be about Christians promoting iniquity, but Sam has not mentioned one iniquity that Christians uh, carry out. Not one. You want to know why? You can't. Why? Because we're led by the spirit and not by the flesh, right? Because we submit to God with our whole heart, because we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, because we deny the works of the flesh and we take on the whole armor of God, right? Breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, sword of the spirit, feet shout with the preparation of the gospel of peace, right? Because we live righteously, right? It's because we, uh, we, we're faithful to our wives, right? We do, we do what Christ has called us to do. We allow our lights to show sign so shine that me and might see them and give God the glory. We're not justified by outward physical acts. We're not justified by lighting candles, wearing fringes or uh, uh, dressing up on holidays. No, we're not. We're not justified by slaying sheep. We're not justified by any of that. You're justified by your faith in Christ. And because you have faith in Christ, you live for him. Christians, I don't deny the works. The works, however, follow salvation. Again, let me help you understand. Justified by faith. And because God has justified me, guess what? I love him because he first loved me. In my love for him, I dedicate my life to him in full service and sacrifice of not the animals, you can keep slaying them sheeps if you want. It ain't, it's not going to make you righteous, Doc, right? <laughs> you know, you, you you can keep wearing them fringes if you want to. It's not going to make you any more righteous than if you put on a wife beater. I'm just being real with you. But do you love your neighbor, right? Those are the, the, the works of the flesh, right? Do you lie? Do you curse? Do you cheat? Do you steal? No, Christians don't sin. Christians don't carry out. In other words, Christians don't practice sin. We don't practice sin. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Christians don't advocate sin. Christians don't practice sin. Sam has not mentioned sin. Sam has said a whole lot of everything into a whole lot of nothing, because I still don't know what accusation he has against Christians, because he hasn't pointed out anything Christians don't do that the scriptures declare we do. Christ, we don't do what Christ fulfills. Feel, right? I challenge Sam. I want to know, do you go to the temple on past on the three pilgrimage feasts, Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles? Are you going to the temple? Are you carrying out these feasts that God said only carry out in Jerusalem? Are you doing these things, right? Are you circumcised? You think circumcision is going to make you more righteous? When Paul said in Galatians chapter number six, if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Sam, you can keep leaning and depending. And I'm not, when I say Sam, I'm speaking to all those who think that you're justified by works. You can try that if you want, but at the gate, he's not looking for your works from the standpoint of your outward acting in uh, ceremonial acts. 
right? He's not saying everybody with fringes, y'all come on in. No, he's going to say everybody with a righteous heart, everybody who loved their neighbor as their self, right? Because in, in loving God, in this, you have fulfilled the whole law. But y'all going to go up in there, then hated all the Christians, then hated all the Edomites, but you got on fringes and you think you're getting into the kingdom. Not going to happen. I'm sorry. And I'm trying to help people understand that so they can come out of that dogma and come into righteousness. The righteousness of God says this, that we're justified by faith. I didn't quote, I, I didn't make it up. I quoted it right from the text. Sola Fide. It's not Sola Fide, it's Sola Fide, but, at the, but it's therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Not a work mentioned there, but guess what? In that we stand and because he loved us, now I live for him. I challenge you, Sam, point the scene out. Christ gave that I don't keep. Point it out. Point it out, and I'm going to help you see that you're in violation of the text when you try to make your works righteous. Your works aren't righteous. Your works are the fruit of salvation. They are not the cause of salvation. This is why you aren't justified by those things. You're justified by faith faith in Jesus Christ and will be judged by the works because the works will prove that we have truly been justified. So there's a difference, judgment, justification. Uh, I yield at this point. We will get more into it in the interrogation round. All right. Yeah, about a minute left. How is the interrogation? Do you each? So we're just going to do this for 10 minutes straight. I'm going to put the timer on. Um, you guys are going to go back and forth asking each other questions. Um, please go back and forth. Don't interrupt each other during the questions. And don't interrupt each other during the answer. All right? A uh, quick question, though. No, nah, no, nah, bro. Doing the inter inter interrogation, I get 10 minutes to ask him questions that he's to answer, and then he gets 10 minutes to uh, ask me questions. It's not a rapid oh. reef, uh, rapid fire round. It's an interrogation round. Okay, no problem. So, okay. All right. So, there, there's not going to be a rapid quick question. Rapid. Yeah, this is going to go to the close after this, then. Let, let me ask a quick question. Um, uh, the response, and I know it's Sam's turn now, but I'm I'm mainly concerned about when I'm and, and even if I want to make sure I'm being fair to Sam as well. These responses, like I got 10 minutes to ask questions. You, you can't take 10 minutes to respond to one question, right? Like so, so can we say you got 30 seconds or less to answer these questions? Well, I don't know about putting a time limit on it. You can do it on your round, um, or I you know, uh or what have you, but um you know, we should be as brief as possible. The the, pur the purpose of the interrogation round is, um, you know, to be concise as possible. So if I say that answer is sufficient enough for me, let's move to the next one. Doing my round, then we move to the next one. On your round, if you say, okay, that's a sufficient enough answer, we move on, then we move on. That way we can keep from running into... Okay. Is that all right? That's fair. Appreciate it. Okay, no problem. So are you gonna do the same thing as him, uh, Mike, or you wanna do yours differently? It comes to your turn. Uh, well, out. I'm. Uh, I think what he said is fine. If if I think he's taking too long, and I think what he said is sufficient, I'll say that's sufficient. All right. And and then he, if I say that's sufficient, then he'll stop, right? And then I can go to my next question. All right. Sounds good. Ready when you are, Sam. Okay. Cool. All right, bro. What does iniquity mean? What is the concrete definition of concrete? Definition, concrete definition of iniquity. Transgression against God's law. Okay. Um, that's actually not it, but um, okay. That's abstract. What is transgression? Let me show you. A, 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 transgression is an abstract word. It's not concrete. It's not something that you can see, touch, taste, feel, or hear. So transgression can be mean different things to different folks. So okay. I, that's why I asked for the concrete definition. And I'm, I'm proving the point here that Christians really don't uh, understand the concrete definition of these terms. Um, but <laughs> go ahead. Well, no, no. It, I'm thinking you're asking what the definition of iniquity is. It is sin. It is the breaking of God's law. 
I, I don't know no other way to answer you. That's that's the Bible that, answer. That, that's a little more concrete, but sin is also uh, an abstract term if you know the difference between abstract and concrete. Actually, well, uh, I, I know the difference, but I'm, I'm just okay. trying to be biblical here. I can well, get well, theological. Well, <laughs> well, would you would you consider the ancient Hebrew, which we find in the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible by Jeff Benner, uh, definition, which means to be crooked or twisted, concrete or or not is that is that more concrete than transgression uh sin and all of that or or no uh it certainly can be concrete those are actually uh wonderful terms to describe it but right bottom line sin is when you break god's law okay and what is god's law and god's law is commands that he has given. Let me give you an example real quick. Adam had a law not to eat off the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He broke that law. Noah had a law to build the ark. He carried that law out, built the ark, right? God gave Moses laws to give to the people of Israel. Christ has given us laws. So the laws that God has given us within a specific time to keep, we surely don't have to build arcs anymore, right? That law has been fulfilled in Noah. We So we, sh we surely don't uh, avoid the tree of knowledge of good and evil anymore because that law has been fulfilled in Adam. Okay, cool. So my next question, since we know that God's law um, is the uh, uh, what he gave, the commandments that he gave to Moshe, uh, when did he end those? And can you give me a... Uh, scripture saying that uh, he ended those for us not to keep anymore. Well, there's 613. You, you, you so here's the question <laughs> there's 613. So I could clearly show you that we are no longer under the law. Okay, cool. Um, you want me to show you that, or are you, you good? Actually, um you would have to define what under the law means because from my experience, okay. most Christians do not mean, that's my next question. What, before you get, we get into that, what does under the law mean? Okay, I'm gonna give you an example of under the law. I, I think- Not an example, bro, because I don't want to take up too much time. I well, no, no, this, 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 this is, I'm just gonna read the scripture, right? You would agree that circumcision is uh, certainly a law given under Moses, right? Correct. Galatians chapter two, verse number three says, yet not even Titus, this is Paul speaking, not even Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. OK, and, cool. Can you find an Old Testament law that requires Gentiles to be circumcised? Yeah, I, I, I can find you several passages. Actually, no, there's not a, a single commandment in the Old Testament for all Gentiles to be circumcised. Okay, the that's not what you ask. No. Well, no. is there an Old Testament uh, law requiring all Gentiles to be circumcised? If anybody was to come into the camp of Israel to participate in the covenant promises, then absolutely. That would that would apply to all Gentiles. Yes. No, actually, that's wrong. Um, actually, okay. the, the okay. only command, the only Gentiles required to be circumcised was those that wanted to partake of the Passover. Yeah, that's the covenants. Exodus, right? ex Exodus chapter number 12. And so, Passover, so, I, so, I ask you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is my point. Um, uh, Paul, did Paul teach circumcision or no? Circumcision of the heart. Did he teach physical circumcision or no? Paul did not teach against those who wanted to be circumcised, but Paul taught the circumcision of the heart. Galatians chapter number five says, if I yet teach circumcision, why am I yet a sinner? And why did he make uh, t t t uh, Timothy uh, get circumcised if he wasn't teaching circumcision? Paul had Timothy. The text tells you why Paul had Timothy circumcised, because he was to be a leader over Jews in Jerusalem. That's right. that's what the text says. Right. First and foremost, I'm asking. I actually you, did Paul teach physical circumcision? Well, teach. Absolutely. I'm, I'm telling you. In Exodus chapter number 12, uh, bro, 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 did Paul teach physical circumcision? No, Paul did not teach that all believers had to be circumcised. No, okay, so what is what is Galatians? No, I didn't say all uh, uh, believers, I said, did Paul teach physical? Circumcision? There are times where Paul recommended people get circumcised, if that's what you're asking. Paul never made that a command, no, he didn't. Okay, Acts chapter number 21. 
uh, verses 19 through 26. He, Paul was accused of being uh, of teaching against circumcision. And Paul did. Uh, Paul denied it by taking the Nazarite vow. Was Paul being a hypocrite or no? OK, let me let me correct you on Acts 21. Paul, Paul. Was, I'll ask you uh, a question. You can't correct me, bro. It's my well, time. But when I can't answer a question that's built on the bad premise, I can't say he was being a hypocrite. Acts it's it's like you asking me, why did he have on blue pants? Acts 21 says, and thou art accused of all the Yahudim, uh, accused of teaching all the Yahudim among the Goyim, the Gentiles, of forsaking the law of Moses, not to circumcise their children, neither to follow after the Hebrew customs. Thank Verse you. Verse 24 says, uh, uh, do this, therefore, that we say unto you, take these folks. I'm paraphrasing the rest now because I don't have the text up on the screen. Right. Take these folks that are already taking a Nazarene vow, already ready to make an animal sacrifices and prove that you're not teaching these three uh, things. So, uh, Paul, according to you, Paul just said in the text that if you be circumcised, you fall in from grace and all of that. How do you reconcile the two? Either Paul was being a hypocrite or he wasn't. So what is your what is your uh, Paul? Uh, Paul actually took the Nazarite vow and was ready to make a sin sacrifice. And in 50 A.D. before he was uh, captured uh, by the, uh, the, the the Judaizers and taken to uh, the Roman uh, proctorator uh, 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 Festus. So now did Paul teach against circumcision or he didn't? teach against circumcision. here's the verse but they have been informed about you that bro, you bro bro you taking up my time bro I, 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 I mean, this, question, listen bro. okay we know what the text okay, is. i'm just gonna answer you paul okay. did not teach people to be circumcised acts 21 is about them saying he taught them not to be circumcised you see the distinction and if you let me read the verse it'll clarify it for you he says, uh, but they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake. Paul never taught the Jews to forsake. They were Jews. Paul himself as a Jew. OK, OK, bro. So so did he teach? Uh, so the message that got to the Galatians that you said, if you be circumcised, you fall from grace was only the Gentiles. That doesn't include uh, the Yahudim, the Jews. Right. Because he was still teaching the Jews to be circumcised. Right. That the verse number one, the verse doesn't say he was still teaching the Jews to be circumcised. And number two, no, Galatians says that, and, and they're both Jews and Gentiles because okay, Paul okay, made that cool. clear. Okay, okay, cool. Paul says in Galatians 5 and 11, and our brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Uh, then is the offense of the cross cease. So can can you expound to me? What Paul, how, how you reconcile Paul saying he teach circumcision here and preach my bad. It says the text says preach circumcision uh, in Acts 21. He denied teaching against circumcision to the Jews. But you saying neither one has to be circumcised. Can you explain that? Sure, because you're not exegeting the text correctly. Paul says, and I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Watch this. Then the offense of the cross has ceased. What Paul is saying, if I was continuing to preach circumcision, then the offense of the cross would be ceased. In other words, he wouldn't be persecuted if he continued okay, to preach. The word if, you need to look that up in the text. And then he said, I wish that those who trouble you will cut the whole thing. Okay. Okay, bro, you preaching, bro. I just wanted you to answer a question. Bro. I'm answering and, the question. And, and, and you're wrong. You missed over the point. It says, I read and I, brother, if I yet preach circumcision. In other words, in other words, if I'm preaching circumcision, why are y'all coming after me? No, and that, if you look no, at the in text, other words, Acts, isn't what the text says. Stop, stop, bro. It's my turn. It's sure. my turn. Right. And right. and in Acts chapter number 24, <laughs> when when he was accused of uh of breaking the law of Moses I, against against okay. Go ahead. Uh, well, there was kind of uh, a lot of back and forth. So you want you want to ask your last? You want to give one go five more minutes, and then I get fifteen. That's cool. Go right ahead. I'm good uh, with it. Hold on, let me put the time for five minutes. Go ahead. Okay. 
Now, in this text, it says, for it, uh, if I preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? If you look at it in the NLT, that's exactly what it says. If I'm being persecuted, Paul, when he was brought before Felix says, uh, uh, and they, they, they have found nothing in me to, uh, to acute to, for them to accuse me. He denied, uh, uh, the accusations that was against him that he taught against circumcision, right? Is that right or wrong? That's absolutely right. Now, no, but let me just say one more sentence. Paul did not teach against circumcision. Right. Amen. You you've been you've been a little bit disingenuous there, bro. I didn't say ask you whether he taught against it. Yeah, yeah, right yes, now, did. I, I did a little while ago, but I'm asking you right now. Okay. I asked, I started you off first and asking you, did Paul preach circumcision? To the Jews, you told me no to neither the Gentiles or the Jews. I asked you whether Galatians was only applicable to the Gentiles, and you told me no. So if the, text, I mean. if the text that you quoted, if you be circumcised, you be fallen from grace, then that means that applies to the Jews too, according it, to you. It right? absolutely does. Okay, cool. But yet we have Paul saying that he wasn't teaching that in Acts chapter number 21. And we have him in Galatians 5 and 11 saying that he's preaching circumcision. So who is he preaching circumcision to? Because Acts, 21 that, don't, Acts 21 doesn't say that and neither does Galatians 5. I, okay. I don't know what you're reading. Acts 21. And thou art a claim that, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles. Right. To, three things Paul was accused of teaching of. For, uh, that to forsake the law of Moses, not to circumcise your children, which is what you're saying. This is what you're saying that right now. That is not now. what I'm saying. Okay. Now, let me ask you this question specifically. Sure. If, if Paul is saying, if you be circumcised, you have fallen from grace, is that, in, in, in according to your interpretation uh, and understanding of that text, is that not teaching against circumcision, physical circumcision? No. Oh, my goodness, bro. That's crazy. Okay, another question. No, listen, listen. Let me because you misquoted the verse. It's cool, bro. It's cool, bro. It's the cool, verse if, if, if you oh, be circumcised, cool, Christ will profit you nothing. It, bro, bro, it didn't say if you circumcise, God, you fall in from grace. Okay, okay. So so if you be circumcised, then Christ, the, the salvation work of Christ has no uh uh, uh it's not applied to you, right? That's, That's what you're correct. saying. Okay, so now if I'm being circumcised as a Hebrew then I can't get any profit from the death, burial, and resurrection of the Christ. Is that correct? That's false. You can. I'm circumcised, but my. I, but I'm I talking don't, about according to the law of Moses, bro. Let's not mince uh, words. Listen, you can be circumcised if you want bro, to be you, according you to the law of Moses. Question, bro. You're not answering my. I'm question, answering bro, the question. And you wouldn't want me to do that to you during your time. Uh, okay. I asked you a specific question. What's the question? If if you if according to your understanding and eisegetical misinterpretation of this text that you, that 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 uh uh paul is saying if jew or gentile is circumcised then christ does have no profit has no profit pretty much means that you have no salvation because the profit of the death burial and resurrection of the christ is that we are saved, right? That we get salvation. No, you you, no? you jacking that text up. You you was totally isolated. Well, I'm asking you a question. And I'm, I'm telling asking... you no, but you you don't want me to you don't want me to explain. No, I don't because you're gonna take up my time, bro. It's cool. But then you don't want me to answer. Right, you did I, I, answer. I, I, you give said me 10 Paul, seconds you, to you answer. Said, you at said least. You, you just said. want to guess or no. Right, because it is a yes or no question. No, it's not because oh. you, you can't jack up a text then and ask me a question. Bro, this is interrogation. It's not a rapid fire, bro. Okay, if, well, I, I can't I answer. If you, if you if you tell me you already Christ had on purple and or blue, cool right? I'm, I'm I'm cool with that. You already answered, and I'm cool with what you said. It, okay, proves, cool. it proves that you are a walking contradiction, but uh, uh, oh yeah, okay. Um, it proves that you contradicted yourself because in one in, in 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 one sense you're saying Galatians uh is talking to Jews and Gentiles, but we find Acts Paul in Acts chapter number 21 taking a Nazarite vow to prove that thou thyself walkest orderly and keepest the law. My next question: did Paul keep the law? Yes. Did all the disciples keep the law of Moses? Yes. Did their disciples keep the law of Moses? No, not all of them. The, 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 the Nazarene descendants of, 
of 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 uh the disciples didn't keep the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. August, uh, Augustine and um uh, Epiphanius, your, your church fathers, don't say that uh, they actually were still keeping the law. The Nazarenes, um, no. It's time. Okay, go ahead. You can go ahead. All right. Okay. Yeah. Two um, minutes. All right. Go ahead and commence. All right. Uh, I'm. I'm gonna pick up where kind of where you left off a little bit. Um. In. Let's see here. All right. Well, never mind. Paul, what laws do Christians break? Iniquity. They. They <coughs> outside. They are out. Can't, oh, with somebody got a mute. Um, if not you, I guess you can mute, mute, uh, brother Jaffin. Okay, Christians break the commandments not to do away with the law to begin with. That's what okay. iniquity oh, is. Thank you. That's sufficient. Can right. you be? Can you name one law specific? Don't you can't just say iniquities or law. Sabbath. What? Okay, Sabbath law. Okay. Uh, can you show me a? Can you show? Because we're Christians. Can you show me? Christ commanding anybody to keep the Sabbath. Yes, Matthew, Matthew chapter number 19. Okay. Uh verse good master, what must I do to inherit Hold eternal on. life? I'm gonna go here. Hold on, Matthew 19, 17. First Corinthians, first Corinthians. Hold on, hold on. Right. Matthew Matthew 19, 17. Right. First Corinthians 7 and 19. Okay, Roman hold on. Because Sabbath is not in. I just want to clarify. Sabbath is not in. When he asked him which ones, Jesus said murder, adultery, steal, false witness, honor your mother and father, and love your neighbor. He didn't say Sabbath. So which now, now where you want me to go now? Because it's he, not in Matthew uh, 19. He said keep the commandments. Okay. Well, we, we, he said which ones? And Jesus answered him. He said, which one? Jesus didn't say 613. He said, which ones? Jesus said, murder, adultery, steal, false witness, love your mother and father, and love your neighbor as yourself. So no, Sabbath's not in there. Okay, Matthew, now what's your next verse? This Ma it? Matthew 5 and 17. Okay, Matthew 5 and 17. Let's see. Okay. Do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Okay, maybe you didn't understand the question. I asked you... What is there say? a what command he... of Christ to yes. others to keep Sabbath? I just gave it to you. Keep Where the commandments. That? That's one. Keep the commandments. The commandments is all of the commandments. That's, that's not that's what one. Jesus said. But, that's, but we done with that. I've already proved that wrong. It is. No, you didn't. What? What? The man asked. The man wanted to know which ones, and Jesus didn't say, "Oh, you know, do what Sam said and keep them all." Jesus answered him. He listed the ones. So you you, you missed. I mean, I, I just read the text. I'm not adding or taking away. Matthew 17 is not a command to any disciple. John 5 and 3. First John 5 and 5. All right. Thank you. John 5 and 3. Hold on. Waiting for the move of the water. No, I said first John, bro. Oh, I'm my bad. <laughs> I'm all at the pool of Bethesda. All right. First John. Five and three. Okay. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. My, my bad, my bad, my bad. Right. That, that's one and three and four. I meant three and four, but I said five and three. Okay. Let me go to three and four. Let's see if it says Sabbath. No, you can, okay. you can keep reading that. What does that say? Five and three. What did that say right, right here? Five and three says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay. All right. We, we do keep his commandments. That you keep God's commandments. Absolutely. Okay. All right. First John three and four. First John three and four. Let's see if it says Sabbath. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Amen. See what you have to prove, Sam, is that after Christ have fulfilled that, and according to the Hebrew writer, He becomes our Sabbath. You have to prove that the outward act of Sabbath is still a sin for us as New Testament believers. You I haven't did, done that. I did prove that already. Well, you haven't shown the verse that says keep the Sabbath. I keep the commandments. Sin is transgression of the law. Keep the right. commandments. First right. John 5 and 3 says right. keep we the keep commandments. It. Okay, let's see. Oh, another one. Follow me as I follow Christ. Yes. 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 So did Christ uh -huh. keep the Sabbath? Yes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did Paul keep the Sabbath? Yes. Wait a minute. And if you're followers of Christ and Paul, then you keep the Sabbath as well. That's yeah. my proof. You well, have that's, that's a whole lot of add to the text. That's not what the text say. All right. Let me ask you another question. Uh what other laws do you so so you say we keep we break Sabbath, which we don't, uh, but but 
because we we understand that we rest in Christ on a daily basis. We don't we don't legalize it to one specific day uh, like like many of you do. Uh, we we're, we live right every day. But let me ask you another question: Is there another sin we can? Is that the only one we break? No. Okay. What other? Ones? Be specific. Be specific. Keep the feast. Keep the feast. Okay. All right. Uh, you which feast? All of them. Okay. So, um, keeping so, the feast is a part of the commandments that the Most High gave to Moshe. Anomia means being outside of the law of Moses because of transgression or ignorance of it. Okay. And so, if you're not keeping feast, then you're outside of the law of Moses. Which All right. means so, so you have a a scripture. Oh, well, let me ask you this: Does the law tell you where the feast is supposed to be kept? Yes. Okay, where? Three of the feasts were supposed to be kept in Jerusalem. Are you keeping those feasts? Yes. All right. You go to Jerusalem three times a year. That's wonderful. That got to be pretty expensive. Do I get to comment to that? If, if you like. Okay. Your problem is you don't understand what keep means. You don't understand what Shema oh, no, means. I, no, that's not my problem because I understand what it means. You're not keeping the law, bro. You, If you're not in Jerusalem, you're not keeping the feast. I don't care how many pigs you slaying. No, we can't do the law, but we can keep the law. There's a difference. And your problem is, what? again, yes. Show me that verse. We can't do the law, but we can keep it. I've never read that. You you want you want me to finish? Go right ahead. Right. The, the Hebrew word for shamar means to guard and to protect. So you can guard and protect the commandments without actually doing them because you're not permitted to do them at the time. The same way the, uh, uh, the, the, the Yahudim kept kept the law in Babylon and in captivity. So the same way that Paul, I, I, I'm sorry, that Dawid, David kept the law, Shema, this is your, your problem is you don't understand what keep means. You should have asked me, could we do the law? Then you would have been correct. Can we do the law of going to uh, the okay, temple? Okay, thank you. That's no. sufficient. I disagree with okay. you. That's that's just wrong. No problem. We, we, can, we, can, we can't keep it. We can do it. I mean, we can't do it. We can keep it. Yes. That's just that's flat right. out not Bible. Oh, OK. So God, God not going to hold you accountable for for doing them long as you're keeping them. What? That's not that's not what I said. That's a oh. straw man argument. No, I'm trying to understand. All right. Let me ask you another question, Sam. So you say so Christians promote iniquity and your premise is because we don't keep Sabbath, which you haven't shown the scripture for. And your premise is because we don't keep feasts, which you yourself have proven that you don't keep either. All right. Let me ask you this. Um, so, so is Jesus our Passover? Say that again. Is yeah, Jesus yeah, our Passover lamb? Yes, he is. Okay. So if Jesus is our Passover lamb, during Passover, did the priest have any functions? I'm not following you. Say that again. During what? Uh, uh, let me say it this way. During Passover, they had to go to Jerusalem, right? There was a function and there was some 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 acts that the priest had to carry out. Would you agree? Yes. I, I right. Do you agree that the Levitical priesthood ended in Christ? No. OK. I disagree. The Levitical priesthood ended in 70 A.D. with the destruction of the temple. It tells you that in Hebrews, I think it's chapter number six. And Hebrews was written before 8070, so Hebrews wasn't talking about 8070. Hebrews was written in 65 AD, five years before the temple was exactly. destroyed in 70 so, AD. So what a Hebrew writer said wasn't about what... what he said that, that the law, that, that which is old, is ready to pass away. That pass away of what he was talking about. Hebrews chapter number five through the end of chapter number five through the end of chapter number 10 is dealing specifically contextually with the Levitical priesthood. And he said it was going to pass away. It was ready to pass away. And it did in 70 AD, five years after well, the writing. Actually, you're mixing a couple of passages together. It was when did Christ become the high priest? Say that again. When did Christ become the high priest? When it was handed to him from uh, John the Baptist, when he was baptized, because John the Baptist, John the Baptist was uh, under the uh, he was a Levite priest. 
Okay, well, let, I'm going to read to you a verse real quick. Hebrews chapter six, verse seven says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications uh, with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet learned he obedience uh, by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Would you would you agree that he's talking about his death and him offering up his life as sacrifice is when he became the high priest after the order of Melchizedek in, in actuality? No, that's not what the text says. It says he offered up prayers. When did he offer up them prayers? I pray not for the world, but for them that you have given me and all that you have given me. I think that's John uh 16 17 saint john not first john somewhere okay all right so you're denying the text what well, a hebrew writer clearly makes the levitical priesthood done away with the levitical priesthood once again was done away with in 70 a.d we know that for a fact because the apostles themselves were still making sacrifices for sin in 58 a.d which was the council of when jerusalem did, when was christ the media when would when was christ the mediator between god and man when I did just, that happen i i just answered that bro 70 a.d is that what you meant 70 a.d no that's not what i said I said, you asked me when he became the high priest, and I said when it, when he was initiated by John the Baptist. Right, then, you, then you asked me uh, when did he become the mediator? He became the mediator upon his death. Well, let, let me read you a verse here, real quick. First uh, Timothy chapter number uh, two. This is Paul writing well before eighty seventy. He says, "For there is one God and one mediator between God and men." the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself ransom for all to be testified in due time. So you agree that before AD 70, that Christ was the one mediator between God and man, right? Yes, I just said okay. that. But first thank of all, Paul did, wait, Paul wait, did wait, wait, wait. I, I, Thank you. That's sufficient. So, right. so the Levitic, so, so, but you still believe that the high priest in the temple had his function with God. Yes. When, when the, Yes, because James was making, he had four disciples making a Nazarite vow. At the end of the Nazarite vow, they shaved their head and done a sin sacrifice. I tell you that in Acts 21st chapter. And that was in 58 AD. 58. Christ died in 30. This is 58 AD. So that's 28 years. You're wrong. After the death you're, of wrong. you're wrong. You can about say I'm text. wrong. You can say I'm wrong all the you want. Don't say sin sacrifice. You're wrong, clearly. But let, but let me go back to here, 1 Timothy chapter number five. It says there is one God and one mediator. But you still think that the high priest before 70 AD was mediating for sin. Yes. Okay. Tells you that, so, tell so you that even though Paul said there was one. one mediator, you think that there was more than one because the Levites were still mediating too. Say that again. Paul said here in Timothy that there's one mediator. You believe there was more than one because the high priests were still mediating, right? No, I don't believe there's more than one mediator. That's, you believe that the high priest continued their function to God uh, be up to AD 70? Right, because, hey. Christ, because Christ is the law. And the law says to make sacrifices and right. when the right vow. Listen, you, you Paul got said in 80, around 57 or so, there is one mediator. Paul didn't write that. Timothy wasn't written in 58 what? AD. No, Timothy wasn't written in 58 AD. It was written during the second century, the late first century, late, late, uh, uh, late first century, early second century by a disciple of Paul who was not Paul. That's at all scholars. That's pretty much a, a consensus on that's scholars. Heresy. Google How? it. Google it. Google it. That's, that's yes. double heresy. <laughs> If Don't Google goes to work, you're in trouble. Anyway, so Paul didn't write Timothy. No, and he didn't. He didn't write Paul's any of the pastoral epistles. So Paul died before AD 70. And so if this was in the second century, and this was one of Paul's disciples who wrote it, the brother had to be 200 and something years old. Say that again. You said this was written in the second century, right? I said the late first century, early second century. Yes. Okay. Right. Which, would, which would have made him between 30 and 60 at the youngest. That's false. 
So, so, so you whoever can say it's false all you want, but the listeners can just this. Google it and let see how many Paul, how this. many epistles did Paul write, and let it's going to you, this. it's going to come First up, Timothy, and it's going to give you the sources. That's sufficient. First Timothy chapter one. It starts off this way, Paul. So the Paul's disciple lied here, right? So there's a lie I, in First Timothy. That's the, that's what that, that's what scholars like Bar Ehrman and Bruce uh, Metzger says. But I don't. Mean, let me people finish. Don't even believe let, in God. Can I can I finish? Bruce Metzger does believe in God. Bruce but, Metzger did. <laughs> but can I finish? Can I finish? First, I'm first, not asking you what the scholars are saying. That's not first, my question. First and foremost, like I said. Paul didn't write any of those epistles. All you got to do is Google it, and it's going to give you the Wikipedia. Okay, and then once you go to the Wikipedia, it'll That's give you the scholastic source. All right, would you stop him from talking so I can ask my next question? Go ahead. You can give my extra five minutes if you like. I'm good. Give my right, extra me, five. I just want you to clarify this one thing. Whoever wrote Timothy lied because he signed it with Paul as Paul. Would you agree with that? No. Okay. So... He, Paul didn't write it. He wrote it as though Paul wrote it, but you say that's not a lie. No. Do you want to hear why? No, not in particularly. I'm, okay. I'm too, I, okay. I'm, no, I'm no too problem. Stretching then. my head. No, no problem. So you discredit all the writings of the Apostle Paul. No, I, I don't discredit any writings in the New Testament whatsoever. I just put them in their proper perspective and know who wrote them or not. It's called textual criticism. That's called bad doctrine. But I think, but that's my time. I think. All right, guys. Uh, we're now we're gonna go to our closing. You each gonna have five minutes. Let's go home to my baby. Okay, cool. Do you you wanna uh, go first, or you want me to go first, bro? Doesn't matter. I'll let you choose. Okay, you can go first. All right. All right. <laughs> I, I think my work is done. This man has stated that all the letters that Paul wrote, Paul didn't write. I really don't think we have to take anything else that he says as factual, scholarly, or theological. We should discredit that because that is absolute heresy. The scripture is inspired by God. Christ inspired Paul. Christ did not inspire Paul's disciple. And so to, to, to make Paul's letters when he's in the corner, clearly being disproved about the Levitical priesthood, he made Paul's letters written in the second century, the, which is totally makes no sense because, because the writer is still writing about the temple that was still standing in first in second Timothy. In 2 Timothy, he talks about the temple, which was still standing at the time. So that had to be before AD 70. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. He, he said we don't keep the Sabbath. Christ is our Sabbath. He hasn't found a text that commands us to keep the Sabbath in the New Testament. You want to know why? Because Sam doesn't have a verse because there is no verse. Right. He said Christians um, uh, in, in terms of circumcision. Right. Christ shall profit you nothing. He tried to make that just about the Gentiles. That was false, right? He tried to go to Acts chapter number uh, 15 to prove that Paul preached circumcision. Wrong. The text was about Paul preaching against circumcision. It wasn't about Paul telling people they must be circumcised. So he, he misinterpreted the text, eisegeted it out of his context to try to build a narrative against Christianity. Christianity stands firm. Christianity is the, the historic faith of the scriptures. We believe the word of God. We live for God. We trust in God. We, we, we sacrifice not animals because what Christ has done away with that. But we present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Right. The man quoted Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is an atheist. And when I asked him a question, he said, well, that's what atheists say, as, as, as though an atheist has any authority in a biblical debate. Then he said, Google. And again, I'm not trying to insult Sam. I, I personally have no issue with Sam. I'm just, I, I'm just discrediting Sam's claim by his own words. If you're Googling to find your information, you're in trouble. I'm not saying you can't get some good stuff off Google, but you better dig a little bit deeper than Google. <laughs> you, you right, and so again, Sam have not proven his case. Sam have not pointed out any scripture that Christians violate. Sam have not vi uh, uh, said anything that Christians go against the word of God. Sam is stuck in the Old Testament. 
So stuck in passages that Christ has fulfilled by and through his death on Calvary. Let me say this as I close. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. We were all violators of the law. And as James declared in Acts chapter number 15, those laws were not even able to be kept by the forefathers of the Israelites. James said, why place that burden and yoke upon them, the Gentiles, when y'all not even keeping it? There's no verse that commands us to keep the outward customs. We keep the inward morality being led by the spirit. And I quoted those verses clearly. Sorry, but if you don't believe Paul wrote the letters of Paul, then I can't take anything else you say seriously. Thank you. I yield. Okay. All right. You ready Sam, for me, Brother yeah. Jeffy? Okay. First and foremost, I want to, you know, point out the fact that how a Christian apologist do, do. I never said Paul didn't write all the letters of Paul. I said he didn't write the pastoral epistles. So that was a straw man argument. And this is what Christians do when they fail in their arguments. Uh, they resort to logical fallacies. Um, they resort to logical fallacies like he, he don't believe any of the letters of Paul. Also, he's talking about uh, Google. If you Google it, for those of you guys out there, you're going to come up with the Wikipedia article. And in that article, it's going to give you the scholastic sources, right? The, the sources of folks who understand philology, uh, textual criticism, and all of that. They understand that the language uh, doesn't add up uh, to Paul. The, the, the Greek, the type of Greek, the theology there is different. And this is why I say Paul did not write it. The issues that are being addressed did not write it. But now we've gotten off. So let me get back to iniquity and confirming how Christians, in fact, does pra practice iniquity. My brother here admitted that Christians do not follow the Mosaic law. When the Hebrews that wrote the Bible, including the ones that was in the New Testament, used the word anomia, they were referring to the Hebrew words of avon and uh, rasha. Avon means to twist or to be crooked. And that's what we saw here today. We saw bro to twist uh, Paul's writings as Peter said, as the Apostle Kepha said, to advocate for lawlessness, for being without the Mosaic law. When the first century Hebrews was writing, when the, when the biblical Hebrews were writing, when they were referring to lawlessness, you want to talk about contextually, uh, they were talking about the Mosaic law. That's the only law that they had. Well, actually, they had two laws. They had the oral, oral law, at which later became the Talmud and the Mishnah. And they had the written law of Moses, so which they considered one. So when they were talking about lawlessness, they wasn't talking about no separate laws of Christ, which there is no separate laws of Christ. I asked the brother to give us uh, a separate law that Christ gave that's not in Torah. And I challenge you viewers, go find one that you cannot find in Torah. You won't do it. Finally, uh, the Christ himself, he asked about the, the commandments. Where does it say keep Sabbath, keep feast days and all of that? That's included in keep the commandments. Uh, I showed you that in Matthew. Matthew 5 and 17 says that heaven and earth will pass away, which is a Hebrew idiom, before uh, 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 all of the law pass away. And we know the, the Christ himself did not fit, fulfill the gathering of, of, uh, of, of the Yahudim. He did not feel, fulfill the judgment of all nations, which is prophesied in the Tanakh. So heaven and earth hasn't passed away. All of the law has not been fulfilled because the Bible tells you that Christ only came to fulfill those laws which pertain to him. I believe that's Luke chapter number 24. So it, uh, uh, as I showed, in the etymology of the word iniquity, iniquity means to be outside of the law because you're ignorant of it or because you transgress it. By Brother Mike's own admission, Christians do not follow the law of Moshe. They follow this imaginary law of Christ that is different than the law of Moses. Finally, and I just said that, I know I just said that, but finally, uh, uh, hopefully, 
unless the Ruach give me something else. Finally, Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, said himself, my disciples, a disciple is not greater than his master, right? Neither is the servant greater than his Lord. You are to do, and I'm paraphrasing now, you are to do exactly what your master says. Christians say they follow Christ, but it's impossible for them to follow Christ if they do not do what Christ did. They said they followed the apostles doctrine and followed the apostles. He admitted that the apostles kept the law. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Christ kept the law. Paul kept the law. The Nazarene disciples, he said no. And you rewind the tape. The brother said no, that the Nazarene disciples of the first century did not keep the law. But if you read the Panarion, which was the writings, ex, uh, extra biblical writings of uh, their church fathers, they all tell you that these folks were still keeping the law up until the fourth century. So by all of these things combined, it should be evident by now that Christians are outside of the law because they twist it, they uh, twist it and make it crooked. And therefore, they practice iniquity by definition. It's been a good debate. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad we could do this orderly. I appreciate you, uh, Brother uh, Jaff. If, if anyone in the audience, uh, the, the viewers have some quick questions, we'll maybe give like five minutes. For you guys to ask questions because brother jaff has to have uh has to go and i actually have some things to do as well but if you guys want to ask questions to either brother mike or myself you are welcome to do so you're welcome to come on the platform as a matter of fact i'm gonna see if i can post this link in uh this chat thingy here and anyone can come on and ask your questions yep there it is the stream yard link the link is in YouTube rejected your comment. This is fairly common when you sharing a link. You may need to share the link another way. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Okay. The debate. I learned a lot from both of you, but I'm going to head out. Okay. Uh, Brother Jeff, if it's just going to head out, if Brother Mike can stick around for maybe five or 10 more minutes, and um, we'll, we'll go ahead and answer any questions that you guys post. I can't pop post the link. So if you guys want to ask in the uh, thingy, I'll post your uh, questions. You can come on and talk with me and Sam. That was that was me. I put oh, that. Okay. I was commenting the one guy who said something to me. OK, brother Jerry says that he has a question for me. Go ahead, brother uh, Jerry. Oh, I, I did so real. Um, I was trying to do brother Jerry. Oh, the thing is moving. I'm not too technical savvy. <laughs> uh, brother Mike. So now I'm posting brother Mike's. The thing is moving so fast. I could brother Jerry, go ahead and ask you your question. Um, Sam, I have a question. Okay, there we go. Let's see if I can post that. Sam, I have a question. Show. And it's going to brother. So real. What in the world is going on? Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Brother Jerry D. The Ola Olio. I hope I didn't mess up your name, bro. What's your question? I'm here, bro. I have uh Metzger's book. Okay, show. I have Metzger's book in front of me, and he says that Paul wrote the pastoral epistles. Where do you get that Metzger denied it? I got uh, Metzger saying, uh, well, post the uh, text because I didn't see that. And, I, and uh, maybe I made an assumption there because he actually uh, 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 had a lot to do with Bar Ehrman and Bar Ehrman's work, and they mirror. So I could be uh, incorrect on that, but I know for sure that if you Google that, um, it'll give you all the, of the uh, sources that tell you that Paul did not actually write the pastoral epistles. He didn't write uh, Ephesians. Uh, he, wow. Paul only wrote 18, uh, uh, seven or eight scholars differ on uh, how many, but I think uh, for second Corinthians or is it second Thessalonians? I think it's, it's second Thessalonians that's in debate. Second Thessalonians or second uh Corinthians, but they all agree that Paul only is pretty much a consensus among modern scholars that Paul only wrote seven or eight out of the uh, epistles that's attributed to him. Hopefully that answered your question. Anybody else?
Anyone else has a question? Sam, have you received the Holy Spirit? This is, uh, oh man, this is somebody else. Uh, this is Jerry Olo and my screen just went brink. But to answer the question, uh, it looks like a sister there. Uh, All right. It says, Sam, I want to know, have you received Holy Spirit? That's There we go. Sister Twyla Stallworth at Sam, have you received the Holy Spirit? Yes, I did. I got the baptism at age 13 in the Holy Spirit. When, when, when I was uh, uh, under the delusion of Christianity. Mm. That's when you got the Holy Spirit, huh? Yes. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> As a Christian. Okay. Right. Any, any questions for Brother Mike or me? You guys can go ahead and, and post them. We don't want to do the same people. I'll make uh, this comment by, by, by Brother Troy Kelly. I uh, appreciate you, bro, out there. The Christian think that the English language was our original language. And therefore, when you speak and break down words, you lose the true meaning of the context. Absolutely, bro. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would challenge him if I can comment on that statement. Go ahead, bro. Go ahead. I, I would challenge him. You know, we can talk to Hebrew if he wants. So, you know, uh, post something in Hebrew and let's see if he can really read it, you know, and, let, and, and I can help him understand. So because Christians study Hebrew and Greek. It's because that's the scriptures were written in those languages. So true Christians are going to study it out in Hebrew and the Greek, at least at least those of us that are striving to be scholarly. OK, cool. Um, I disagree with that. Um, as we've seen here today, we couldn't get a concrete definition, Hebrew definition of iniquity um, because Christians really don't get into the original uh, language, which we would call the paleo Hebrew dealing with the concrete. I suggest a great book by um, Jeff Benner. I'm a student of Jeff Benner and it's called the ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible. And it breaks down the, the, the bilateral, bilateral and trilateral root words, which all the words stemming from those root words carry the same pretty much uh, base meaning. So uh, any other questions for either me or brother Mike? Any other questions for either myself or brother Mike? Let's see if we got something. The Apostle Paul, Hebrew and coining Greek linguistics. So you reject Paul. OK, here we go. Let me post this. Uh, this is Lazarus Conley. So you reject Paul. How about Second Peter? Let's make this clear. I am a defender of Paul. For those of you guys that go on my channel, I just uh, uh, debated another Hebrew brother who was against Paul. He said Paul was lawless and all this other kind of stuff. So I certainly do not reject Paul. Paul is my second favorite apostle after the apostle James. And no, I don't reject uh, second Peter, even though um, uh, Bart Ehrman does. So I accept all of the writings. I don't reject any writings of the New Testament. I just weigh them by the uh, the precepts in the Old Testament. That's all like we were like we we're told to do by the author of Second Timothy. And um, according to Acts chapter number 17, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures daily. The scriptures being the Old Testament, the only thing written at that time to see whether Paul's doctrine was true or not. Well, Sam, quick question for, you know, on that question, because I know you don't believe Paul actually wrote the pastoral epistles. Do you still consider them inspired writings on the same level as the books that were written by Paul? I don't consider any of the New Testament inspired. I consider the whole New Testament. Let me let me answer that. I consider the whole New Testament, the writings of men. The only part of the New Testament I can consider expired is when it's quoting, uh, quoting the uh, the 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 Old Testament. That's what in, is inspired, according to the biblical definition of being inspired, according to uh, that definition, because you don't let me say this. Scripture is the Old Testament. You will not find a pre only new Old Testament only. There's not a new a book in the New Testament that is scripture. I, I could show you. I could show you differently, but I know our debate. Oh, we'll we'll pick that up next time. <laughs> okay. But I could I could definitely show you differently, brother Yerim Yahu Yasharal, Acts thirteen and forty two. 
And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them next Sabbath. Good job, bro, and showing um, that's one of the ones I had in mind, showing that the Gentiles was actually the Gentile converts was actually keeping Sabbath. And uh, Paul neglected to tell them, oh, we don't worship on Sabbath no more. I'm coming on Sunday or Monday. Good job. Oh, we got a question for Brother Mike. Finally. Cool. Who asked me a question? Brother uh, Welsh Fair the third. I appreciate you, bro. Um, Michael, why did the Jews and Gentiles meet up on the Sabbath in Acts 13? The text that we just posted that Brother Yerim Yahu just posted. Why did the Jews and Gentiles meet up on the Sabbath in Acts 13, 42 through 44? That's that's simple, because that's what that's when they met. That that was their custom. That was their custom from from children. That, there's there's no command to do it. In the new testament that that was their custom that's just the bottom line so where did they get the custom from if they weren't being taught that they got the custom from the law they were raised as though jesus came under the law he when jesus was here jesus was under the law galatians 4 verse number 4 he was made of a woman made under the law so christ himself was raised in jewish culture and within the jewish culture that that's when they met that, i mean it's it's as simple as that. That's when they met. The question isn't whether they met on the Sabbath. The question is, is it a sin to meet on any day? That's the question. See, I go to church sometimes almost every day of the week. That includes Saturday. Right. But am I in sin because I like it on Sundays? Am I in sin because I go on Tuesday night Bible class? Am I in sin because I'm going tomorrow night for Friday night worship? So 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 that's what? the problem. No think, one denies you're wrong. You're not wrong for I, I know a church that has Saturday and Sunday services. You're not wrong for celebrating on the Sabbath, but it's not a command that if you don't, you are in violation and you are in sin. That's the issue. OK, bro, I think you get it mixed up. Worship and keeping Sabbath. You're supposed to worship every day. Your life is supposed to be a worship. But we're talking about the specific commandment not to work, uh, not to cook, uh, not to do business. Um on the sabbath so i think you're getting that mixed up but we got another question brother yaram yahoo said the gentiles i'm not sure what he meant by that but we got a question from so real so real says when jesus says to the apostle in john 20 he who hears and receives you receives me how is this not extended to their apostles if the new testament is it is not inspired uh, I'm great question I'm not actually. Uh, can you? Can you? Uh, yeah, I'll explain. Okay. You you would agree that what Christ says is authoritative, right? Right. If Christ tells the disciples, if they hear y'all, they're hearing me. How can you say that their words aren't aren't inspired? Well, let me. Great question. Absolutely a great question. Now. What I my definition of inspired and what you guys definition of inspired is different because I not I didn't say it wasn't authoritative. It is. If it's not authoritative, we can rip it out the book and 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 not use it. So it is authoritative. We do adhere to the writings of the apostles, but we don't uh, regard them as scripture. They are not scripture. There's not a book in the New Testament that's scripture. The New Testament contains about one third of scripture but it in itself is not scripture hopefully that um we got uh welsh brother welsh again i don't see let's see if we can get somebody else um uh, understanding that the majority that of people scripture. they are not scripture well, i'm There's sorry not a book in the new testament that's scripture. the new testament contains about one third how, my of bad. scripture but it in itself is not my oh bad. this brother yahukanon ben yahuda appreciate you bro um my brother you who can on there at defenders of the way ask mike to to read uh the greek 1033 the uh strong's greek 1033 in the strong's for the word meets which is used in uh first corinthians 6 and 13 and one first timothy 4 and 3 and the point that he's making is the the, the word where it talks about don't judge people against uh, eating meats. Um, uh, it, it's the word broma there, which means uh, clean meats. I think, or abstain from eating meats or something like that. Let's see if we can find a more. Um, well, 
he wrong. <laughs> he, he wrong. All right. I, I know you all try to make that about being clean meats, right? Uh, their, their thing's a little stronger than Strong's as well. I'm, I'm looking right in Lower Night, it says uh, food. I'm looking now in the Double Greek, where it says simply solid food. I'm looking in the Greek English Dictionary, where it says food or solid food. I'm looking at the uh, the Linear English Historical uh, Lexicon, it says that which is eaten, food, meat, provisions, victuals, food, ruin, food from the devourer, that which is eaten, food, meat, uh, out of the intermediate Greek English lexicon. So you guys, uh, somebody have told you wrong. Um, okay, so what text were you referencing that off? I went right to 1 Corinthians 6, 13. What, what does the text say? 1 Corinthians 6, 13 says, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. But that's the okay. verse he put up there. So I, I would have right. To the right. And I think uh, mainly he wanted uh first uh Timothy. I forgot the uh verse there, but okay, but it's you, still broma. It's, it doesn't matter if it's broma. Okay. This is I gave you all those definitions, but right? the context, I think he was trying to make a point there, and it wasn't uh totally clear. Sam, read the uh the Greek 1033, please. <laughs> Um, uh, Lazarus Conley says, you do realize the New Testament scripture was also seen as first Clement and the Episcopal of Barnabas, et cetera, right? Yes, Lazarus Conley. I do know that the uh, first and second Clement, uh, the Episcopal of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas was attached to the oldest manuscripts uh, as uh, uh, in the New Testament. Yes, I do know that. I, I do realize that. And it's not New Testament. It's not scripture. If you look at first Clement and you go through first Clement, uh, he only refers to the Old Testament exclusively as scripture. When he's referring to the writings of the apostles, he'll say uh, uh, the apostles wrote or what have you. But uh, 90 percent of the time when he says as it is written, he's talking about he quotes uh, uh, the Greek Septuagint which of the old testament and when he says scriptures uh he is it's always 100 percent referring to the old testament that's good that you brought that up because yes first clement oh also first clement he still talks about keeping the law a disciple of peter and paul in which we're told that the disciples of peter uh by brother um mike holloway that the disciples of the apostles didn't keep the law but first clement which was written toward the end of the first century, the beginning of the second century is still talk. I'm, I'm sorry. First Clement that was written in uh, uh, just before 70 AD. Uh, some scholars say the end of the first century, the beginning of the uh, second century. But that's impossible because the internal evidence, he mentions the temple and the sacrifice is still going on. So the a disciple of Paul, first Clement, Clement of uh, Rome, actually was still talking about keeping commandments first clement chapter number 40 if you want that reference he's still talking about keeping the commandments and he's still talking about uh making the sacrifices and the priests still holding position yeah no 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 he not but uh but so you can find those quotes and then forward them to me it's first clement chapter number 40 i, I got the books right in front of me but let me right. let me well, get well, um, well, put up first Clement chapter number 40. Do it. I mean, then you can make your point. What does first Clement chapter number 40 says? Read the hold chapter on, for me. Hold on, let me let me get it. Let me get it. Uh-huh. All right. This was so Clement has. Which was which was it? His exhortation to the heathen, the instructor, the stramata, the fragments of Clements. Uh, he, he's got several several writings here. This is First Clement, bro. I'm a, I'm gonna pull it up for you because I got it right here. First Clement, um, chapter number forty. It's in my ebooks here. I got a PDF version. It's loading up, and I'll go ahead. It's right. I, this last book I was in, so it's right here, and it's well burst. And it should be on chapter 40. I'm going to just read it, bro, real quick. First, Chim First Clement chapter number 40 says, um, these things, oh, is that what I want? Um, that's 38. Wow. How did it jump all the way? Let me turn my phone sideways. First Clement chapter number 40 says, uh, wow. My phone is acting crazy here. 
first clement chapter number 40 says these things therefore let me make sure yep these things therefore being manifest to us and since we look into the divine knowledge talking about torah it behooves us to, to do all things in their proper order, which the Lord commanded us to perform at stated times. He's talking about the feast and all of that. No, uh, you say he's uh, talking about that. Not, That's not what it's saying. Here the end of the matter, bro. He's going to tell you. It's going right. to tell you right here in this text. Okay. The very next verse. He has enjoined offerings, right? Context. He has enjoined offerings to be presented and services to be performed to him and and that not thoughtlessly or irregularly but at the appointed times and hours so that appointed times and hours he's talking about the sacrificial offerings and stuff of surrounding the the temple priesthood he's going to tell you further in here where and by whom he desires these things to be done he himself has fixed by his own supreme will notice that in order that all things be done piously be piously done according to his good pleasure may be acceptable to to him those therefore who present their offerings at the appointed time are accepted and blessed not cursed because they're keeping the law for inasmuch as they follow the laws of the lord they sin not so Clement's idea of sin is not making those sacrifices and all that. And this was written just before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD for his own peculiar services are assigned to the high priest. Right. And their own proper place is prescribed to the priest and their own special ministrations devolve on the Levites. The layman watch this now. The layman is bound by the laws that pertain to the layman's. Now let me break this down for you. Clement in, in 70 AD, just, just before the temple was destroyed, is actually talking about the high priest and saying they're still doing the will of God. And he said, you can't be a high priest. Don't worry about being a high priest or a priest and the Levites. They keep the commandments, the will of God, that that, that is to them, but all of the layman are to keep the law that pertain to them. This is why when Christians say, you can't keep 613 laws, keep telling them all 613 did not apply to, to the individual. You had laws to the priest. You had laws to the high priest. You had okay. laws, to, me, laws to the king. You had laws to women. Let me read this verse and I'm going to get Wait a minute, wait a minute. You had laws to the, to, to the women. You, you, so you, you, uh, all the laws didn't, all 613 did not apply to everyone and so here and i'm closing so brother mike can get his say but clement is writing to the corinthian church a gentile church and he's telling them that they're still responsible for keeping the laws and he was taught by peter and paul okay so so i could help you with that because you've contradicted just that's actually absolutely ludicrous once christ sacrificed for sin uh, to 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 go and take an animal to the altar as though that animal was going to purge you for your sins, the sacrilege, right? And anybody who did that, according to the Hebrew writer, have tread the blood of Christ underfoot. So that is just that's just absolute that's just absolutely wrong. But but and and you've said during our debate that those things didn't even apply to the Gentiles. Now you're saying that they're commanding the Gentiles to do it. But I just want to read one verse here. I never here. said that during the bit debate. I said circumcision did not apply to the Gentiles. Okay. All right. Though. So the rest of the laws did, just not circumcision. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. All the laws that, are, that, right. that the right. Gentiles could keep apply to them. Okay. Them I just want to read this verse here, and then I'm and then I got to get off of here, uh, right here, just to show you that that uh, Paul's writings were scriptures, and, and I do mean Paul, uh, not his disciples, his, his writings were scriptures, right? In 2 Peter chapter number three, verse 16, Peter associates Paul's words with the scriptures. Verse 16, uh, it says, as also in all his epistles, uh, let, me, uh, let me help you see that I'm talking about Paul. Uh, verse 15 says, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, 
in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. Watch this as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Peter clearly here equivocates Paul's epistles with the rest of the scriptures here. So he says they're twisting Paul's words like they do the rest of the scriptures. So Paul's words certainly were synonymous with the scriptures. Peter considered them scripture and so do the New Testament church. Okay, give me five minutes, bro. Let me put. I can't give you five, bro. You well, just... give me, give me, give me two minutes because uh, I wanted to respond to that. I wanted to, but you can drop off and I'll continue to respond. I just wanted okay. to give you the yeah, opportunity. I, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to yeah. uh to address that. I, I didn't even take five minutes to read. That. Okay, so I just yeah. want to, but, but, but I, I got to hit it. Let me ask. You, uh, here's the thing. Uh -huh. In that text, this is a simple uh problem of reading comprehension, bro. It, it really is. I agree with you there. Now, let me finish because I ain't cut you off, bro. Um, it's I'll let you finish. Uh, it's a simple reading comprehension problem. Peter there is not calling Paul's writing scripture. If you understand subject, verbs, and predicates, the subject there, that, matter of fact, I'm going to pull it up so I'm not just talking. I'm going. I'm pulling this text up on the screen. Uh, like I said, I would love to have you stay, but I've dealt with this. For those of you guys that are watching, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it. Uh, also on my on my channel, I have a video uh, where I goes into uh, Second Peter. It was in one All of right. my one of well, my listen, debates. Well, listen, I, I want to say I appreciate you, man. I think everything's okay. been very cordial. Uh, you know what I'm saying, and I appreciate that. I think it was a good discussion, and um, I'm gonna have to drop off. But thank you, I appreciate it. And thank thanks uh, to Jephthah as well. Okay, bro, I appreciate you as well. All right, have a good day. Now. All right, you do the same. OK, I'm going to hit this and then I'm going to get out of here. I appreciate everyone tune, tuning in. But we're going to see if Peter called Paul's writings uh, scripture uh, here. I got to get to my screen again here. Give me one second. Screen yard. Uh, let's go to screen share. There we go. Screen share. I'm going to share my screen here with you guys. We're going to see if Peter called Paul's writings scripture. See, it's a simple problem of reading comprehension. Now, I don't know how to take this note off the screen for some reason. Um, I'm not too good with this stuff, but um, I should be sharing my screen here. Um, let me see. Jeremiah, 2 Peter. Okay, now let's take this scripture and let's work backwards. And I'm going to be done. Um, I, I promise you guys that because I'm, I'm, I'm done here myself. Uh, second Peter chapter number three, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in notice that word in all his epistles, not all his epistles, but in speaking in them of these things. You you guys been in school. What is the subject here? These things. I'll prove it to you, right? I shouldn't have to if you guys know simple subject, verbs, and predicate. Speaking in them of these things. So it behooves us to find out what these things in Paul's epistles that he was writing about, in which some things, so now we got these things and some things are hard to be understood. So what is the these things he's speaking about in his epistles that are hard to be understood? Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures. So the, these things are the scriptures that he's talking about unto their own destruction. Now, if we go up to verse 15, we get a clue, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, the long suffering. So this is the topic that we're talking about. Second Peter three and 14. Uh, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things. Here we go again. What such things are we talking about? Are we talking about Paul's writings in general? Are we talking about Paul's writings being scripture? The scriptures, as we've already defined, is the these things, the some things, and the such things. Now, let's see what that scripture is. Be diligent that ye be found of him in peace without a, a, a spot of blame. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, the promises that's written in scripture, look for a new heavens and a new earth. That's the these things, some things that he's talking about, wherein ju judge of righteousness that Paul wrote about in his writings. 
uh, looking for and hasting, verse 12, looking for and hasting to take note of this, the coming of the day of Allah wherein the heaven shall be on fire and dissolve and the elements shall melt away with fervent heat. Now, simple tool right here. This is scripture. This is the scripture that he's talking about. He's talking about the words of the prophets that uh, they wrote about the day of the coming of the day of Allah or judgment day. That's pretty much what he's talking about. The scripture contained in Paul's writings about the day of the Lord. It's simple subject verbs and predicates. It's not hard. Here we go again. Second Peter three and 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, the heaven shall make melt away. What manner of uh, persons ought ye to be in all manner of holy conversation? Now, let's click on this second Peter. Let's go to our tools. And let's go to cross reference. Let's cross reference this verse. If you got a scripture, uh, treasury of scripture, not scripture knowledge. Let's see what scripture Peter was talking about. Let's see if I can find it here. Here we go. It's just this simple. This is the scripture that uh, Paul uh, Peter was talking about that is contained in Paul's writings that folk twist. Right. Not Paul's writings in general. Our Allah shall come. This is uh, Tehillim Psalms 50 and three. Our Allah shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Isaiah 34 and four and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and their host shall fall down as a leaf uh, falleth off of the vine and as the failing fig from the fig tree. Um, this is the scripture uh, uh, that uh, uh, Paul was actually talking about. It's not hard. It's called hermeneutics, doing Bible study, cross-reference in the text. Now, I'm going to give you one more verse, and then I'm out of here. If you continue on, verse 10 tell you, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Verse nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. So we're talking about the promises, the day of judgment. Verse seven tells you that, but the heavens and earth, the Shemaims and the Eterites, which is now by the same word kept in store, reserved into fire against the day of judgment. So we're talking about judgment day that Isaiah, David, and all the prophets wrote about. How do we know that for sure? Peter tells you. When you were in school, you were taught that the first uh, uh, sentence or sentences in a paragraph is the topic sentence and the subject, which gives you the subject, right? This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful, verse number two, that why? Th that you might be mindful of the words of Paul, the epistles of Paul? No. Why is he writing this? To tell you that Paul's writings of scripture? Well, let's let the text speak for itself, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy Nebaim and of the commandments of us, the apostles of Yahuwah uh, 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 and Savior. Well, I think that word is Kyrios and Savior. So what he's saying here is I came to put you in re remembrance of the, the, the writings of of the holy apostles, the holy prophets, which was talking about the, the, the day of judgment when the uh, heavens and earth is going to be melted away with fervent heat and which was commanded by us, the apostles, right? Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, the last days all throughout the New Testament. So um, this text in itself tells you that when you put it, use simple subject verbs and predicates, then you know for sure that he wasn't calling Paul's writings scripture at all he was calling the scripture contained in paul's writings scripture so once again i appreciate everyone that tuned in uh please go uh be sure to go ahead and um like the video subscribe uh share the video if you will i appreciate everyone uh coming out i hope you guys uh have uh you know heard the arguments we tried to make sure this was amicable the, the brother is my brother even though he's in iniquity um, as I prove um, that he's actually in iniquity and um, I still love him as my brother and we were able to have a uh, great discourse here. I appreciate you guys tuning in and uh, we're going to sign off. This is the defender of the way signing off and I'm going to say shalom.